Let's welcome in our good friend Ben Bergeron. Ben, thanks so much for doing this. How you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing really great, guys. Thanks for having me. Well, let's get right to it. You have uh, you've made a big decision here, and I will let you tell everyone what that is and why you're doing it. Yeah, so um, it it is a big decision. It's something that uh, didn't come too easily, but um, I have decided to step aside from coaching elite athletes at the CrossFit Games um, to focus on building the comp train community and platform and really take the last 15 years. This will be my 15th. So I'm going to go to the games this year and coach my athletes through this, but it'll be year 15 for me uh, consecutively and taking the lessons I've learned from working with all these great, amazing athletes and bringing them to the, to the bigger, larger community. I think that there's a little bit of a, a void in the space. You know, there's people that are like, you know, trying to kill it and make a profession of this. And then there's people that, you know, go to the gym three days a week. And there's a big, huge gap in between those two things. And what I want to do is be able to bring the lessons I've learned over the last 15 years to that community. So uh, I'm going to be passing the torch, which I'm, it makes sense. This is the timing seems to make sense here. Um, having done this for 15 years and then also the opportunity to have um, Cole Sager, who's one of my best friends and an incredible athlete. And if there was ever a uh, person that exemplified what we're trying to do at Comp Train, um, take over the role of elite coaching here at Comp Train, um, he's going to, I'm going to be working with him for the next year to pass the torch. So he, uh, he steps in and continues the, the journey that I started a long time ago. Man, I, I, I mean, immediately Cole Sager is one of those athletes that is synonymous with comp train and just the development in, of the program and, and the brand over the years. But I, I guess the first question that jumps to my mind is why now, why does now make sense for you? And, and what was the impetus behind it? And maybe what were some of the kind of the ruminations around making that decision at this point in time? Yeah. So I don't think you ever know when it is actually the right time to make anything right. But you kind of listen to your gut and, um, I, I think it's now because, um, you know, I've been working with Cole for as long as I have, and, uh, we've developed a, uh, in a philosophy an ethos, a methodology, um, uh, and he understands the, the, the coaching role, the way that I would want to. So the first thing is I, I don't want to leave the post without a, um, supremely capable person to, to man it when I leave. So that's the first aspect. This is like, I can't do that until I feel comfortable there. That box has been checked and then some, um, I've been talking to Cole about this for the better part of, uh, you know, for months and months. Um, so we've been, uh, grooming and growing him into this position and it's not, nothing's happening until after this year's games. So he is not today the head coach of comp train. Um, I still am. But um, after this year's games, he will be taking that. So that's the first part of like, how do you know this feels right? Is that feels right. And then the next part is I want to go where I feel like I can have the most impact. And for a long time, you know, the, the, the comp train way was to work with, you know, a very, very small select group of athletes. That was by design. I, I wanted to, you know, for a long time, it was the two guys, two girls, you know, it was the, um, you know, the Matt and Katz and the, um, the Brooks and the Coles is like two out, two guys, two girls for a real long time. And I, I, that fueled my fire in a big, big way. I wanted to push the envelope of what humans were capable of doing. That was where my passion was. And I still love CrossFit, the sport. I think the games are one of the most incredible spectacles in sports. I love everything about it. I, I, it's, it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing. That passion's not going to go, but I think where I can have the most impact has evolved. And I think it's changed from those working with four athletes, pushing the pinnacle to working with, um, a bigger group of athletes. And, um, that's where I, I if I, if my whole kind of career has been centered around trying to have impact, which it has, this seems to make sense now to, to make this shift because Cole is in place to kind of do that next thing. 
And speaking of Cole, you, know, you see this a lot in other sports, but sometimes the best athletes, and Cole is an incredible athlete, don't make the best coaches. Why right, is absolutely. he the right guy to take over? If you've been in the room with Cole, um, when we have like camps or the athletes get together with, um, you know, for training for semis of the games, the, the question would be answered. He is a coach. He's a coach. That's what he is. Um, he's had a passion for coaching, for helping other athletes. His whole um, reason for getting into this sport is to have impact and help other people. Um, the reason he wants to create his own platform is so that he can go and change lives. He's the giver type person. So he, at, he, he fits that mold so, so well. He's also one of the longest tenured athletes at this level of anybody. So he has more experience than almost anybody. And he's been with us for such a long time. So it's, uh, it, I think he's going to, um, he's so fired up for the role. I think that he's going to be able to bring a lot of um, new blood and excitement into, into, the, into our organization. It's funny you mentioned like being in the room with him. I, I sat down with him at the NFL Combine and caught up with him in an interview. And we were just kind of chit chatting around some of the ways that he felt like, you know, the the marriage of CrossFitters and like football players and things like that, like where things can be learned on either side. And you could see the switch flip in his in his in his eyes and his yeah. in his demeanor when he was starting to get into the instructional and the teaching and the educational aspect of it. I hadn't seen that yet. And and I guess now in retrospect, I'm like, oh, okay, now that makes sense. Maybe yeah. that was something that was, you know, kind of in his foreview now. But uh, I'm curious, you know, obviously the the he's a you know he's a coach by trade. I I, I think there's two ways of looking at, um, you know, handing things off. I think sometimes coaches they're like, hey, I want someone you know cut from the same cloth, but I want them to put their evolution on it. I want them to take it somewhere that maybe my natural personality or um, who I am doesn't go, won't go or can't. And there's other people that, Hey, I want you to continue to carry this ball and continue to carve the path forward that I've already started. Is there one that's more intriguing than the other for you? As far as like, what do you think Cole is capable of? Yeah, I, I it's a great question. And, um, it's so cool that you got to see that side of Cole. Cause it's what I see every single time we're with him. He's, he lo he geeks out about the sport. He mm, is, yep. Um, he's a, he's, he's a, he's a student, he's a nerd, he, but he's also an incredible communicator, uh, a lover of people. So he's going to be able to do things that, um, you know, hopefully that I, I wasn't even able to do, whether it's following my path or car or carving his own, um, I'm not leaving comp train. So I'm going to help for the, I'm here for as long as I can possibly be a part of this thing. Yeah. So it's not going to be a type of thing where um, I'm handing the reins off to him and I'm going to, you know, sail around the Caribbean. Like I'm here to Sounds make nice. this, yeah. this, this whole thing. That's, that's a part of the plan, but just not yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's going to be, um, yes, I want him to be able to bring his spin to it. I want him to bring his fire. I want him to bring his knowledge, his approach and do it his way, but we're going to do it together. It's going to be, it's not just like, um, it's the, it's not a, it's never been about anyone's show here. Um, it's not the Cole Sager show next. It's the way we do this thing together. We're going to get back to the show in just a moment, but want to take a quick second to tell you a little bit about our sponsor for today, Podium Nutrition. Now, Podium Nutrition is a supplement company built and born within the CrossFit community by five-time CrossFit Games champion Matt Fraser and filmmakers extraordinaire, The Buttery Bros. And they just released their new Solos collection, allowing you to mix and match and create your own supplement blend if you want. Me personally, want a little stimulant-free pre-workout. I'll take a little bit of this hydro salt right here, mix it with some beta alanine, the supplement that Matt Fraser himself said, makes him feel like he has a third lung and 
I'm good to go there. Or post-workout, I'll take a little bit of this whey protein. I like the peanut butter crunch because it's delicious. And mix in some creatine monohydrate to make sure I don't lose any of my personal fitness gains. So if you wanna check out anything from Podium Nutrition, you can scan the QR code that's on your screen now and it'll automatically knock 10 bucks off of your next order. Or go to 321podium.com, use the code TEF to let them know we sent you and get 10 bucks off as well. Once again, that's 321 Podium or scan the QR code on your screen to get $10 off your next order. This is probably a question better for Cole, that's better suited for Cole, but we don't have Cole, we have you. But if he's going to transition into this role, does that Number of people necessarily... that have wished that they were talking to Cole instead of me. Like... <laughs> 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 that's not what I meant, but yeah. does this mean that his uh, his athlete athletic days or his days of competing are more or less done? Yeah, it's a great question. And no, it's not. He's going to, and we've seen it in our sport, but it's just rarer. He's going to be a player coach um is he'll and he'll play that role for as long as he can that would be now that should raise a lot of red flags for a lot of people again unless you know cole right and i know that you guys know him at least a little bit and you go like how can somebody really invest into other people that might be potential competitors um this is why i think that there might be only one person that can actually do this really really well and yeah. it's a it and it's Cole Sager. Um, he's not going to. He isn't about. Um, you know, I, I talk about like a, a pie guy. Like it's not about do I get a bigger slice of the pie. Cole has from day one been about let's together make a bigger pie. Like mm -hmm. it's about like let's grow this whole thing together. And when you see him working with our other athletes, you know now he's not holding anything back. He's giving everything he can to these guys to make them better. The next question becomes like, well, okay, I can see how that would work on maybe, you know, in December. How does that work like actually at a competitive event? And for people that aren't, you know, haven't seen the behind the scenes of the way it actually works at competitive events, the head coach doesn't work with all of the athletes at competitive events. Each athlete has a specific coach at an event. And we'll continue to do that. Cole will still have a coach at competitive events. And each of our athletes there will have a designated coach at those events. So it's not like Cole is going to be running the meetings at the games for athletes and so on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I guess another aspect of that same question is Cole has really been the, the I don't want to say an outlier, but um, he's been remote basically in Washington for his entire right. his entire yeah. career. Um, is the plan to, for him to continue to be remote in that regard? Do you feel like that's a uh, uh, a job that he can do from where he's at, or is there going to require a move or any shift in that? Yeah. So part of the reason that we want to create the space till um, after the games is to answer questions like that. All of the like the the real specifics of like. Um, are we going to be working with four athletes or 14? Are we going to be doing everything in person? Are we going to be doing majority remote? That's a lot of that depends on um, the, what we feel like the best model is for Cole moving forward. What are the challenges that he is going to be facing, not only in just continuing what Comtrain is, but building it? Because it's a much different landscape now than it was just you know even five years ago. Yeah, um, I think that it's the what are those challenges that are not going to be unique to Cole. It's going to be what are the challenges for any coach trying to um, get people to win the CrossFit Games going forward. Um, it really comes down to like three main things. Um, the first one is knowledge. Like, do you have the understanding of what it takes to get someone to that level? Um, the next is communication. Um, you know, and that's for just trust. So are you, and Cole's going to do phenomenal with that. Like he's a, one of the best communicators I've ever been around and just loves people. Um, and the next is bandwidth. And that's just how much time can you commit to that? And that's really one of the big reasons that I'm stepping aside is because I can't build this comp train community into what I believe it can be, which is, you know, let's call it like the, the most resilient, strong, community in the world, I can't do that while still coaching six hours a day, six days a week with these guys, 
which is what it requires essentially to, to try to get people onto the podium. So, um, in terms of those three, Cole's a phenomenal communicator. He has incredible, incredible knowledge. The biggest challenge for Cole and most of these athletes, most of these coaches is the bandwidth component because, mm-hmm. um, you know, most of these coaches, it's, it's a strange art. You guys know this. It's a, it's a strange space We're we're in this, mm-hmm. like, we're not in our infancy and we're not mature. So we're like an adolescent sport and there's a lot of awkwardness to adolescence. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. Of- <laughs> I've seen Sean's, uh, <laughs> middle school photos. Oh, there's, there's plenty. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So there's still like, there's still a lot of developing things happening. Yeah, even awkwardness is taking that as an insult <laughs> compared to my middle school photos. So. Oh man. <laughs> what, what do you see the, the future of, and, and I, I guess I would still qualify and, and I train, uh, comp train as a training camp, a group of athletes who train together for a specific goal. And again, it's such a different landscape than it was when, you know, you first got involved in comp train, I think was one of the first kind of on the map as it, it, the landscape is completely and totally different. What do you see the future of this landscape being as we move through adolescence into adulthood? <laughs> it's a, it's a guess, right? Um, mm-hmm. and I don't know the answer to that. And I think that, um, I, be- I believe we have as much solid footing as we've ever had in our space. What I mean by that is every year for the last, you know, I think this is going on year 17 of the games. Um, almost everything about it has changed. <laughs> like we had to wait for the rule book to come out every year for people to even understand what it is that they were going to be doing this year. Mm-hmm. And I believe, and I don't know this, we have a really good, strong foundation, meaning, well, in years past, it was, you could just show up to the games and compete. And then there was this thing called the open. And then there was the open and sanctionals. I don't know if you guys remember sanctionals. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry, sectionals. 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 There was yep, sec- yep. sectionals. That was yep. before yeah. the open. Sectionals. Right? Yeah. Yeah, right, right. So mm-hmm. sectionals were in real life events that got you to the games. And then there was the open the next year and then open and regionals. And then it was, you know, um, then it became the, the sanctionals and then became like, and now I, it seems right. It's, it seems we're like at least the, the format of open quarterfinal, uh, mass participation, then 10%, then the, 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 the really, really fit. And then let's find out who's going to be there for the real thing. You know, we've toyed with, you know, that we want participation from every country or we're going to have 200 athletes there. I believe that we've at least solidified that. I think that what's coming down the pipeline, I think we've got it teased a little bit this year is a lot more data analytics to figure out um, who's coming from what areas. I think that there will be a little of a feeling out process like any data takes time to learn. I've actually think that they've, um, you know, done a pretty solid job of, you know, year one being that thing. Um, but I think that this is what's, what's going to do is whenever things start to solidify, they start to mature. If things are changing all of the times you have to adapt to the changes and you can't mature. You're just trying to stay alive, you know, Mm. It's not the strongest who survives, but the best uh, adaptable to change. That's what we've been trying to do for 15 years is just adapt to the change, adapt to the change. When this thing does, and I think it is, um, becomes a, the foundation gets a little bit stronger and we all know what we're doing. It'll allow for a, a little more of the camp model. It'll allow a little bit more for um, sponsors to get involved because they understand like, can I sponsor an athlete at quarterfinals? Is there any exposure there? Like in years past, we didn't, if you asked somebody that three years ago, they'd be like, what's quarterfinals? And somebody <laughs> like, can we, can we pay someone's way to regionals? No, there's not regionals this year. Oh, like it's hard to get involved when at, at multiple levels from athlete to coach, to sponsor, to media, when you don't know what you're getting involved in. So I believe that, 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 um, that will help the sport grow a lot. It, it, 
from Comptrain side of that, um, what does what do you foresee as uh, the obstacles for Comptrain evolving to stay at least competitive as a program and as a camp um, with that you know foundation potentially solidifying now, um, you know at least for the near future. Yeah, it's a, it's the athletes. It, I mean, it always comes down to like um, having really great athletes with really great coaches that get along really, really well. That's going to be the foundation for um, for us at CompTrain, everyone else in our sports and everyone in every sport, right? That's the way that you're going to try to get to the top. Um, you know, it always comes down to, you know, one of those three things. And when you have the three things together, that's when magic happens, right? It's when you get the Belichick and the Brady and they are like, they are, they see their, their vision is completely aligned. That's when masterful things happen. So that will be continue to be the, the, the challenge for comp train is to um, work with the best possible athletes. We can give them as much as we possibly can um, and make sure that we are all super aligned in what it is and how we're going to chase that greatness. I want to get back to the season here in just a second, because you've been around for every iteration of that, as you just summarized. But I do want to ask you, you know, as you look back on your time with CompTrain and, and your role there through the last, you know, 15 years, is there anything you look back and you say, you know what, I wish I would have done that differently? And if so, what was what would it be? Um, yeah, there's there's, um, you know, there's. I've worked with some of these, like a lot of these amazing athletes, right. From, um, you know, working, I started with my wife. Um, mm -hmm. she was the first individual athlete I ever worked with and she was a top 10 games athlete. And then it was, um, working with Chris Spieler. And I, I think that I was actually the first coach in the space. Like that's a kind of a weird thing to conceptualize yeah, one of them way back, way back in 2009, like you, your coach was who taught classes at your affiliate. And yeah. most of these guys competing were actually affiliate owners. So they didn't have coaches at all. It, it didn't even, the role didn't exist. Um, but like working with Chris and then I worked with Becca Voigt and Michelle Latondra and Matt Fraser and Katrin David's daughter and James Hobart. And, um, um, you know, it, it's been an amazing, amazing ride. And whenever, um, any of those relationships, um, come to a close, you're always left with, you know, um, what could I have done differently scenarios? And um, I don't think that's unique to um, the space. It's kind of like whenever, you know, even when you were, you know, dating the girls in high school and it ended, you're like, huh, what could I have, what could mm -hmm. I have done differently there? And I want to give everything I can to everyone around me. So whenever, um, uh, whether someone retires or, uh, moves on, it always comes up. Like what, what could we have done better and more? And you go through the, the, the kind of the litmus test is like, should we have had that athlete living in our basement? <laughs> should we, <laughs> um, have, should we, um, should we, should we have had that athlete move into our basements? Like it's, should we um, have given that athlete a job at our gym? Should we not have given that athlete a job at our gym? It's like every like you're always looking back and kind of like wondering what are the lessons learned from from every part of the journey, and we take those lessons and we try to use those rolling forward to the next iteration of what we're doing. Hmm. Yeah, I'm. I feel like I want to dig into that more <laughs> and, I, and I want to be respectful, you know, obviously, cause I like, I know you, you, you toss a few out there, but I'm just like curious now you're going, I'm like, all right, who's he talking about basement gym? <laughs> like, uh, I, I guess maybe that's. Yeah. Uh, so I, like I we had, uh, so like James Hobart lived with us, Katrin David's daughter lived with us. Uh, um, um, Rachel Martinez is one of the games athletes. She had a job yep. here. Cheryl Nasso, Whitney Glenn were both games athletes. We gave them jobs at our gym. Um, and then there's the opposite side of that, right? Which is Cole, who's been a remote athlete forever. It's like, what's the, what's the right model? And we're constantly trying to figure that out. Is it, you know, we were the, you know, we were the first ones to try to like, let's get everyone in house, you know, like, and 
first off, our model was like, I want to just want to work with a few really great athletes. That was the first, always from the beginning. I never wanted the, um, you know, work with, try to work with 20 people aspiring to make the games. And I wanted to work with the two guys and two girls that could potentially win it. Um, and that's why I, that's why I want to take this new approach, which is I want to work with, you know, everyone raising their hand saying like, help me make me stronger, fitter, faster, more mentally formidable. Um, but there's, uh, um, there isn't the right path. Right. And I think that's like every single sport they're going to go, you're just trying to figure out what is the right thing for that athlete. And, um, if there's a constant that I've learned, it always, it shouldn't say always more often than not. Um, the best thing that you can do as a coach is communicate. It's the, it's the, it's, it sounds cliche or maybe it sounds like too simple, but, um, the more communication you have with your athletes, the stronger and better it is. And that's why I think the relationship with Cole is as good as it is because I've worked with him for so long. Um, he is across three time zones and on the other coast of the country, but, um, just the hours we've accumulated both in person, um, on the phone, on text messages, sending videos back to each other. Um, it's, uh, it's been a, a long, long relationship. I wanted to get back to the, the season structure again, because you said the current structure seems right. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people may kind of do a double take at that because half of our season right now is online. And that mm -hmm. seems to be kind of bring up more open. It's, it's opened the door for a lot of criticism and things like that. And, you know, some of it's, I think justified some of it, you know, not so much, but anyway, it has stirred up some controversy. First of all, why do you think this seems right? And then, you know, what do we, what needs to happen in order to make sure that this current structure can survive going forward and help grow the sport? Yeah. I think it's strange that people poke at that. It's because the, what the alternative is, um, there's the open and then it's in real life. And there's just, the reality is the constraints of running in real life events. Mm -hmm. And from the, the resources, from the manpower, to the capital, to the equipment, to the just pure time of shipping things around the world, um, it's, it's not an available thing. Now we can yeah. try to do it under, and, and we've explored it. We've done it with the sectionals and sanctionals where we, you outsource it. And those models didn't work very well. I believe that the open is, and a three week open particularly, is a, uh, a phenomenal way to cast the really wide net. Then from there, you're giving 10% a chance to play in the next round, which makes it a whole lot more interesting because what used to be was let's have the open. We have you know, a quarter million to half a million people in this thing. And then let's talk to 300 people, 200 people. That's a, that's a really big cut. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, the fact that it goes to 10%. Now we're talking to the tens of thousands of people, which is really fun and interesting, but not only that, the people that were the 15th percent, you know, that you look at, everyone's looking at their percentile now at the finish of it. And they're mm -hmm. like, I was 83rd percent. Wow. Well, if I buckle down a little bit next year, maybe I can crack into that top 10. So you're really expanding it another 10%, if not greater. 20% of the population feel like they are now, quote, competitive. And you're giving now a second opportunity for 20% of the population to be a competitive, not a participant. Because before, if you were outside of the, if you were the 98%, you were a participant, you weren't competitive. Now 20%, 10X are now quote, competitive athletes trying to make it that next level. Why would we not want that? And the, the in real life version of that is impossible. So it can't exist. You can't run an event for tens of, in real life of tens of thousands mm -hmm. of people. So phenomenal, like we get another 
20% in essentially involved, excited about the next round. Now from there, that next round, we could debate this next round, right? Should it be the super regions? Should it be reg mm. regionals of old? That's a good debate. And I, I, I would love to talk shop about that because I like the old regional model better than this yeah. one mm -hmm. because it was regional. Like my gym could drive and cheer people on. No one from or my gym is driving from Boston to Orlando to cheer on the athletes from our gym that made it. You know, it's just that used to be a really a big rallying point for us. Like we could drive to Albany, New York. We can drive to Canton, Massachusetts, where these things used to be held. Um, and then, you know, people are looking around and going, where is everybody? You know, last year, where is everybody at these regionals? Like, where is everybody? There's no, well, no one's there because you have to travel four states to get there. And it's, it's a big ask for gym members. They want to go and cheer on. At a regional level, there's the super fans are few and far between at the regional level. At the games, yes, people are going to travel. Mm. That's their thing. They're going to travel five time zones to get to the games. They're not going to travel three or two or one time zone to get to a regional event. Who goes to regionals? Friends and family. You know, so it's yeah. a, mm -hmm. it's a, the friends of the people at the gym. Well, if you're asking people from our gym to, you know, go from Boston to Florida, that's a tall ask. And I think that's going to be one of, if they're looking for uh, revenue from ticket sales, which will help grow the sport and support a better event. And they're looking for excitement at these things. I, I think that's the, the regional regional model is a viable option there. Hmm. It's interesting I don't know if that's because a new thing now. The, the regional, regional. <laughs> yeah. So, go out. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, like, yeah. It, I mean, it, that that makes sense. Like, you think about like the the proximity to events back then, and and how you know regionals were well attended, and you got people yeah. from. Also, I think you know when you, and this is a tough thing because I go back and forth on this all the time. The talent pool maybe wasn't as dense at the event. But it also increased the likelihood that someone from your gym and or town or region was participating at regionals, which in turn brought a wider net of people that could could attend. And I, I guess like with CrossFit taking over these events now, they probably want to shrink and, and control first before they expand the number of events. At least that's just what it seems like for me. I'm, I'm, I can't speak for them. But it's that also like... Yeah, it's it's also like, well, how do you balance the two, right? Like, it, yeah. you, you take away, you give back, you take away, give back, and then now are we making another season change? It just seems like, um, yeah, I don't know. It seems like this never ending uh, kind of yeah. merry go round. If, I, if that idea right there is like that, we're changing, taking away, going back, change, like, I would rather just stay consistent than mm -hmm. even if like I'm not complaining that my people can't go to Orlando. But mm. if people are wondering why people aren't showing up to regionals, I th I think that's a, a really strong answer as to why. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's enough of a reason to go back to it. And also, we don't know what we don't know. We haven't seen this thing yet. So we haven't seen yeah. Yeah. the four-day regional um, with, you know, whatever it is, 60 – plus athletes, athletes and 60 teams and this cr this crazy whatever it's going to be which is exciting you know you want to see what's happening there and then there'll debates will rage forever of when when we when we see who makes it and who doesn't like because different regions have different cut lines and this athlete doesn't make it from this one and this athlete does from this one because there was more athletes taken that's going to in a fun way, especially for you guys, it's gonna it's gonna create a lot of conversation. <laughs> yeah, um, and and you mentioned that kind of brought up uh, something to me as well. Do you think? And this is a less quantifiable thing, I guess. But do you feel like the passion from the sport on the individual affiliate member level is um, the same? Because I do think, like back to those regional days and how it was attended, well attended. It, as the sport was on this rise and it felt like you were in this snowball and everybody was hopping on to be a part of the avalanche. Right. And, um, and with the changes and everything like that, maybe that initial like spark is gone. Um, but at, you know, at times we still see participation globally and in, in that spark starting to light 
you know, in other areas of the country, but on an affiliate level, you know, being a part of CrossFit New England and, and such a long established affiliate, do you get that same sense that the same passion is there or is it just different? It's a good question. I think that, um, both, I think it's there, but I also think it's different mm. because, um, what you said is it's really exciting to be a part of something that's growing and expanding. Like that's, it's just, if you're in a small startup company and every year you're doubling in size, that's a really exciting environment to be a part of. If you're in a fortune 500 company and there's 19 satellite offices around the U S that might not be as exciting, but that doesn't mean that the company isn't as viable or relevant or anything else. It's just, mm. there's this uniqueness to being a part of something that's growing. And I think that always is in, is, um, breeds its own level of excitedness. Like, look at what we're a part of. Um, I don't even know what was the participation numbers this year in the open. Do you guys it was about, know that I number? think si signups was around three thirty. I think three twenty. That's about, a good number. Or, or, that's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like probably the second highest ever then, right? Didn't we have one year yeah. that was almost four? So we, we had we had one that was just over four. There was one that yeah. around 350, but that was on a downturn going the other direction. Four was in 2018, right? Yeah, just over four was 2018. I think it was around 420-ish, 418. Mm -hmm. um, and then it started a downturn, and we hit 350, 360 on the way down going the other direction. Yeah. And then now we, we, we you know, yeah. 330. So, uh, yeah, maybe like this is a new beginning for us, right? And it's a new beginning for a lot of people coming out of two years of uh, a pandemic. So um, not to mention there was a year that we did two opens in the same year. Like what the hell was that? <laughs> so um, so now maybe it is part of this new like growing and new thing. And then next year we're in um, a new location for the games. And um, that could be a lot of like a uh, new upswing, right? There's the stability of the season. We are upswinging into this thing. There's a new level of maturity to it. Um, and it, it starts to grow again. I, 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 I really think that we will get to that, you know, 500,000 um, signups in the open in, in not too long. Hmm. Let me just throw a theory at you. And I've kicked this around a little bit and Tommy and I have talked about it, but it seems like, you know, back in with the big growth areas of the games, you know, and I, I put that between like, you know, 2011 and 2018, uh, more to the early side of this, but, but games athletes and affiliate members were more or less intertwined that mm -hmm. as the sport has become more professionalized that has somewhat changed and i'm wondering a if you think that's true and if so what kind of effect do you think that has had on the just the overall interest in the sport yeah i do think it's true in the case of the, the 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 proof of that is the camps right so you mm -hmm. have people that used to be a member of an affiliate leave and move to a camp and now they're not training at their affiliate anymore so that's for sure true um i think it's had the if not it's not good or bad but it's had the effect of like there's a little bit more of a gap between what it means to be a pro and what it means to be a regular mm -hmm. affiliate member and i think still think what's really cool about our sports is the accessibility of these athletes but it's just it's not quite what it was in 2016. Mm -hmm. i think of that I think of like, it's cool that you said, Sean, it was like 11 to 18. I really put like uh, 15, 16, 17 as like the really kind of heyday of this thing. Yeah. You know, there's something real. Uh, Madison, town is awesome. The Align Energy Center is not StubHub. The Coliseum mm -hmm. is not the tennis stadium. Mm -hmm. um, the lake is not the Pacific Ocean. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. there is something, there is no camp Pendleton, you know, like there is something really crazy and magical, amazing. And the fact that they got athletes on a plane and flew <laughs> them to the ranch mm -hmm. at wake up at three 30 in the morning, you need your driver's license and a backpack, nothing else. Like that's to me, we've never been able to the capital um event probably the second best thing that's ever happened at the games the best being get on a plane we're going to the ranch <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. So I, I just think that that's like a, and the capital by the capital, I mean that event. That, this right, year right, right. Like yeah. a, I think that was, um, and I, I, I do, I think that that was the heyday of this thing. Um, and then, you know, it was the transitional phase of um, every year there was a new girl winning it. And there was only one guy that had one, you know, it was the rich mm -hmm. show. And every year was a new guy, a new girl. And then Kat won twice and it was the beginning of the Tia era. And then um, Rich was leaving. It was the beginning of the Matt era. Like that was, that's a really cool time in the sport. Mm -hmm. um, early on, it was really neat in the, you know, the Kalipa days and the, um, you know, the Sam Briggs when she won, but it was at its infancy. We were still trying to figure out who we were. Mm -hmm. um, world's fittest? Eh, definitely the <laughs> fittest you know, for sure. Like the fittest that's invited to the barbecue. Uh, but once like Rich got involved and Rich started winning continuously, that's when it became like for sure, like yeah. claimed the world's fittest made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Well, if we are going to keep this, so this is the other thing I want to ask you. If we're going to keep this current system and it seems like we are to your point to get some consistency here specifically with the online portions what needs to be better from your perspective there i i think we're trending in the right direction um i i like to see it as participatory you know when i um when i do this with my affiliate I want to be able to run the event smoothly in my affiliate. Like that's what, if we're, if the whole model is set up and I believe it is for the success of the affiliates, right? That's what we're creating trainers. So trainers can coach at affiliates, affiliates pay the dues. And that's what makes the whole thing a viable entity. I would like it to see where our members can participate in the open in a really accessible way. And I mean that in two ways. And I think that one of them we're solving. One of them is let's make the movements, movements that my members can do. So there was a year where the first movement of the entire open was double unders. Like three, two, one, go. Here's week one, movement one. We're all excited and okay, 50% of you can't can complete this workout. Now that's different now because so many people can do double unders. Mm -hmm. At that time, mm -hmm. that wasn't the case. Yeah. Fast forward a few more years, movement one was muscle ups. It's like the first movement of the CrossFit Open, I can't remember if it was week one or, but maybe it was the week two, it started off with X number of muscle ups and then wall balls or something else. It's like, well, you're kind of out. Like they don't get to play. I think that we're solving that in that form of fashion. We see wall walks instead of handstand push-ups, and you got to earn your way to the higher skills. I love that. I think Boz is programming this very, very well and really systematically in terms of like, um, they look like couplets and triplets, but they're not their chippers, right? Because it, mm -hmm. it did it with mm -hmm. the quarterfinals as well. It's like every round, you're just kind of moving up in load or skill level, and you kind of like earn your way there. That's such a, that's a, a phenomenal way to keep participation. But the second part is it's a real challenge for a gym, you know, and I don't, I'll just use myself as the example where we have classes of 20 plus people and we have to get those classes to do 25 foot shuttle runs. Like if, like think of, think of the logistics of running 20 mm -hmm. plus people through a 20 minute workout with 25 foot shuttle runs. Like you're, that's really challenging. Is it as mm -hmm. bad as it was a few years ago, which we start off with the workout, which was the same thing, 20 foot overhead barbell walking lunges. Is that a great test? Phenomenal. Does it look great on the open announcement? Love it. When you get into class and you got to run 20 people through that, what you, we actually had to do, we could, we have a huge gym. We have, a, we have a, a, an 8,000 square foot gym. We could only run six people through that workout at a time. It was an AMRAP 20. We have classes of 24 people. Like we can't even run our <laughs> operation. We have to switch class times. Like mm -hmm. if we want to see this thing grow, make it to where the affiliates can run these things seamlessly inside the hour long classes. That's what has to happen. 
people in their garage, like they'll figure it out. People that want to do this one-offs can't figure it out, but we need to be setting up the affiliates for success. And it can't yeah. look like a disruption to the normal business model. Yeah, I, I agree. With, yeah. I agree with that. I, I think that's a great point. Because I think too often the, the criticism comes from the looking at the top of it, not the base of it, which I think is your point, where it's like, if we can't, you know, if we if we have to disrupt what we're doing at the affiliates, like how do you expect us to get more people signed up when it just becomes a huge disruption? So yeah, most yeah. people look at the top and how is it affecting the top athletes? And are we judging this correctly? The, and things like the that. top athletes, you know, Glassman said this a long, long time ago, we're casting a really, really big net. Mm -hmm. All we need to do is make sure that the the top 10,000 big fish make it or not even 10. What we have to do is make sure the top 100 fish make it through and they're taking 10,000. It's, mm -hmm. you know, actually if there's, mm -hmm. if there's 300,000 participants, they're taking the top 30,000, like the top 40 to 100 athletes are, it's not going to matter what the test is. It's just yeah, not right. like you yeah. could, you could throw anything and they're going to make their way through that. The open is a, is not about them. The open is to determine who are the fringe athletes on the, the quarterfinal level. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. um did, did you have more season stuff because i was going to no, no, kind of shift yeah. gears a little mm -hmm. uh one, one kind of shifting back to some of the i guess the the things on the horizon for you you mentioned like building the comp train platform um and i'm curious what your vision for is for that given that i think maybe some people might not realize now but like you have a pretty extensive platform already you know whether it's masters and you know all, all the different uh, yeah. tracks and programs that you guys have built over the years. I, I couldn't be more excited about this. Uh, so I believe that it, um, for um, each of us to be our very best self, it takes three things in terms of what we're trying to do in the space, right? It takes what the obvious one, which is like, let's build our physicality. Um, we have a certain um, approach to training Um you know, it's based off of all in CrossFit, we call it threshold. And that's what I'm a big believer in this threshold thing. The word gets thrown around so much. We need to be, but there's a, there's a real method to building fitness. And um, I'm excited to bring that to a bigger population because right now, yes, we have a, a pretty wide reaching platform, but it's really built around people that are trying to maximize the potential at the CrossFit games. This is now extending back, backfilling it. And when we backfill, what most people do, if you're a good trainer, when someone walks in your, or you approach somebody for the first time, or Tommy, you meet another soccer dad and they're like, dude, Tommy, you're so fit. Like, what do you do? Usually what I a good trainer happens. does is goes, ha. all right, then Sean does. <laughs> then yeah. usually what a good trainer will do is go like, well, what are your goals, right? What do you like? Because a good trainer needs to know what your goals are to kind of like put, I would, I would argue that I actually don't need to know your goals. Fitness is fitness. You need work capacity across broad time and mobile domains. That's as good a definition as we've ever heard. How do we get there? Constantly varied function movements performed at relatively high intensity. We can, so I know that we can do that. What I actually need to know from you, Tommy, or what if Tommy's talking to soccer dad buddy, is um, if you're going to come to my house and we're going to train together, the first thing I need to know is how much time do you have with me? That's what I need to know. And whether you have 30 minutes or three hours, that dictates the programming. So what do we so first thing we need to be able to do is create a an, an adaptive program that's going to that's going to morph based off of how much time you have to train and what's really interesting is someone like you tommy might train for 90 minutes to two hours most days but there's also days that you have a busy day and you're gonna catch an early flight and you only have 30 minutes well every day you need to be able to kind of adapt your training to fit the available time that's what we're bringing to the world is a functional fitness, really high level. It's not easy. It's hard. It's not for everybody, but a program that produces really high level, high, high level results, but it's adaptive to you and how much time you have now. The second thing out of that is not only the physicality thing, but 
I mean, you guys know my approach to this. It's the mentality thing. And I believe that your mentality can be a, an invisible ceiling that you don't even know exists. That's holding back your physicality. In the past we've done, we've, we've touched on this. It's a huge thing I do with my athletes. It's as big as the physical thing. And in the past we've dabbled into this in the comp train platform, but this is now a big thing that we're delivering on a daily basis. Every day when you come into our platform, I talk to you. You get a minute to two minutes of me talking on video to you about what uh, an area that we can focus on to build our mentality. And then the third component to this is, you know, what's really interesting is when you think of comp train, you think of CrossFit. When you think of CrossFit, you think of affiliates. The majority of our followers actually don't train an affiliate. So there are a bunch of these awesome, amazing people, but they're lone wolves out there. Actually, they're lone sheepdogs out there, right? Mm -hmm. They're not wolves, they're sheepdogs. Mm -hmm. So they're by themselves on these islands. And if you want to be the best version of you, you not only need to be physically capable, mentally unshakable, but you need to be a part of a tribe with like-minded shared values, belief systems, because that three things together are what spin you up to be your best version. So in the past, we've really kind of just layered into this physicality component, and it's been really centered on how do we get people to the center of the podium at the CrossFit Games? Now it's that not only that, we're not leaving that, but it's it's incorporating um you guys. Honestly, it's like it's for mm -hmm. it's for you guys and it's for me because that's not my goals anymore. I want to be, you know, the fittest soccer dad at the games, but I'm not gonna try to like, you know, um try to make it to a semifinal. Mm -hmm. So it's the physicality. Then it's also we're doubling and tripling down on the mentality aspect. There's also a place in our platform now where you can find a one-stop shop to learn more. So I grew up loving the CrossFit Journal. Like that's like, it was my library. It was my resource. It was the place I went to way above and beyond textbooks or anything else. It was my center of truth. We we are, are we have a um a comp train university where we have a um a huge library of resources that we that we create that we're giving to people on a platform as well we also have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comp train gyms out there affiliates that follow our programming in the past it's a real challenge so our people travel around you know, they go and do a business trip and they want to stay on the programming at an affiliate, really challenging to do. We now have a really easy accessible map where you click on, and it'll show you all the comp train gyms around the world. And it's super cool. You go into, there's, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens all over Europe and there's hundreds in the U S and, um, so it gives you this idea that you can do this in real life as well. Mm -hmm. Then we have this tribal cool. aspect where it's like, there's message boards and you're friending people. It's, um, this has a this is where i'm putting my focus um i'm still a the games coach this year but knowing where this is going and the platform that i want to create and the community i want to create and the level of um ownership i want to take in developing this community this is the reason i want to spin my focus into this and allow cole to take the reins on the uh let's get people to the center of the podium yep the last question I have for you, and I ask this to most anybody who's, you know, making a, a change in their career or, or, or path is, you know, what are you most proud of when you look back on your 15 years uh, in the space? It's a great question, Sean. Um, you know, there's the, the obvious ones, which is like the, which, which get the awards, the accolades and the applause, right? Which is, you know, um, I, I was lucky enough at one point to coach um, the male and female individual athletes at the CrossFit Games in 2016 when Kat won for a second time and Matt won for the first time. That's like the that's like the um, the resume thing that I'm probably most proud of. But the the real thing is, um, you know, it's, it sounds really cliche, but it's it's the relationships I've built um, over these 15 years and. Um, 
you know, um, you know, people like Cole, people like Katrin. I still, you know, my daughter is going out to visit and spend a week with Katrin next week. Like we're still like incredibly good friends. Um, it's, it's those, um, not only the relationship, but what I feel as a coach, the, the, the role I played in their development, both as athletes and as human beings and the way that we've, um, done this thing together over the years. It's been, when I started this thing out, I, if you, you know, I became a personal trainer in 2002. If you told me then that I was going to be uh, a, a CrossFit games um, coach, first off, it didn't exist for another five years. <laughs> but even in 2007, when I became affiliated and there was the CrossFit games, you were like, you're going to be a CrossFit games coach coach some of the best in the sport and, you know, um, be in this thing for 15 years and develop this comp train platform. And I, I, I wouldn't even have words that was so not on the radar at all. I was just trying to run an affiliate and give everything I could to the, the, the few athletes that I was working with. So, um, there's a lot to be thankful for the opportunities that CrossFit's created and the games have created for me. Um, the way the community has embraced me, um, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that I don't take lightly at all. Um, you know, my wife and I grew up with this community and this sport, you know, um, the, the, the first year at the StubHub center, I was her coach. I was, I was competing on a team and, uh, Brian Curley, the first client I ever had in my life. Uh, won the masters that year. And, um, you know, from there, it's just been like this ongoing thing. We thought that was like the biggest, most amazing. <laughs> We're in the yeah. stuff up center. <laughs> Progenics is giving $50,000 to the winner. It was like, this is it. Uh, and to see where it's come, it's just, uh, I think that if there's a singular thing that I'm probably most proud of to get back to the original question, it's just the fact that I've been a part of the growth of this thing. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not to say I helped it grow. I just like the fact that I was uh, able to kind of like hitch the wagon along for the ride because it's been super cool, particularly through the years you said, Shauna, that like, you know, that 11 to 18, those kind of magical growth years was really, really special. Well, Ben, thanks so much for taking the time and, and best of luck in, in the future. I know you're going to be successful with it and uh, we look forward to you know, bugging Cole Sager now for stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah, love it, guys. You guys do amazing stuff. So I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time. Thanks, man. And uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thank you.